One of the most surreal conversations I've ever had in my entire life was on the Paris subway somewhere around midnight, one o'clock. We had caught the very last train. I was talking to a beautiful woman from Transylvania about Dracula. We were coming back from the opera. Yes, I like opera on occasion. You have a problem with that? The study abroad program required all of us students to participate in what they called cultural activities. Henriette, the professor in charge, announced we had to either go to the ballet or the opera. Everybody in the group chose ballet. I don't like ballet. You have a problem with that? Just a few hours before I was supposed to leave for the opera, Henriette and two other ladies came to me and announced they would be joining me that night at the opera. Oh, by the way, if they're going to have to go to the opera, not like I asked them, but seeing as how they were going to have to go to the opera, they were going to do this right. They were going to dress to the nines. And oh, by the way, I better dress up to their standards as well. The entire time I was in France, the one time I broke out a suit and tie. But don't worry, I still wore my cowboy boots. I showed up at the new Paris Opera House with three beautiful, elegant women in tow. One of them, a retired model turned French literature professor, and got me more than one weird look. After the show was over, we had to hot foot it back to the subway station so we could catch the last train home. Henriette could run in stilettos. That takes skill. The train ride was pretty long, so once we'd all settled in, we started talking about the opera we'd just seen. There were spooky, supernatural elements to the story, so the conversation naturally drifted into spooky stuff in general, and at one point, Dracula was brought up. Henriette told us that in Transylvania, Vlad, the historic inspiration for Dracula, is seen as a very complicated figure. On one hand, he's a national hero because he defended Transylvania from the Turks. But on the other hand, he brutally murdered a lot of people, including Transylvanians. So yeah, complicated. I started talking about the symbolism of Dracula, what he represents in mythology and popular culture. The three ladies were most interested in talking about the symbolism of Bela Lugosi's Dracula from the 1931 Universal Monster movie. When we got off the train and left the subway station, we had to walk several blocks through a very dark part of Paris. I had three beautiful, elegant women all trying to hold one of my hands or my arm all at the same time. At one point, I said, ladies, this is ridiculous. If something does jump out of the bushes at us, I'm going to need my hands free. Henriette says, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just making sure you don't run off and leave us. I said, if a bat turns into an Eastern European man in front of us and I decide to run away, you think you're going to be able to stop me? <laughs> when we got back to the auberge where we were staying, I discovered I had fingernail marks on the palms of both of my hands and my right bicep. I might have been able to run away, but it would have cost me some skin. Why am I telling you all this story? There are two Draculas. There is the historic figure and there's the mythological figure, and they're not the same thing. They serve two very different functions. The historic Vlad is a story about a real man who went down a very dark path. And don't get me wrong, there are valid lessons to be learned in this story. On the other hand, the mythological Dracula explores our most ancient and primitive fears. In the last 50 or 60 years, Dracula has been reinterpreted as a seductive, sexy bad boy. Men want to be him. Women want to be with him. Arr. We'll get into why this reinterpretation came about a little bit later. Traditionally, though, Dracula was not a nice guy. He was not somebody you would ever want to run into. Specifically, women would never want to run into Dracula. To this day, the most common visual interpretation of Dracula, and it doesn't matter if we're talking movies, TV shows, cartoons, comic books, comedy, horror, parody, it doesn't matter. 
The most common visual interpretation of Dracula is a derivative of Bela Lugosi's 1931 interpretation. Yes, there were earlier visual interpretations, but Lugosi's is the one that has defined the zeitgeist. His is the one that determines how we visualize what Dracula would look like. Why? The symbolism. Everything associated with death, tombs, crypts, coffins, shrouds, have all become visual representations, symbols of death. Dracula warns, though, when he meets Dr. Stewart's party at the theater, that there are things far worse than death. From time immemorial, there have been stories about creatures, vengeful spirits, zombies, ghouls, vampires that crawl out of the graves to torment the living. The Bible itself warns us tombs are full of disgusting, unclean, evil things. We have two ancient fears for the price of one here. On one hand, it's just the natural fear of death itself. But on the other hand, is the fear of death gone wrong. The fear of being caught in a state somewhere in between life and death. An undead. And even worse, in this unnatural undead state, we might actually do harm to the people we love the most. With Dracula... For the first time, we have a story about a vampire who still has his consciousness, his intellect. He has wants, needs, desires, goals, an agenda. This makes Dracula an even more frightening monster. Make no mistake, this guy is pure evil. He is an intelligent, cunning predator driven by his lusts and his desire to feed off of humans. Dracula murders indiscriminately men, women, and children. The very first person Dracula murders once he gets to London on his way to the theater is a little flower girl. When we first see Dracula, it's his clawed hand reaching out of the coffin. The coffin symbolizes death. The clawed hand symbolizes death as well. But the clawed hand also symbolizes death death reaching out trying to grasp life, an unnatural, deviant, evil act. We see the same clawed hand when Dracula tries to take control of somebody's mind, forcing them to do things against their will. It symbolizes the perverse evil act of death trying to control life. On the ship to England, the ship where Dracula kills everyone, Renfield promises I will obey you, master, if you allow me to feed. All I ask for are the little ones. When Renfield is in the insane asylum, we learn he has a habit of sneaking out at night. And at one point, the staff read a newspaper article where they learn little girls are lured into the bushes where they lose consciousness and bad things happen to them. Dracula and his minions prefer to prey on the weakest, most vulnerable members of society. Remember, the first thing Dracula did when he got to London? Murder a little girl. And then there's the infamous Dracula bite. Kissing, nibbling, biting the neck is a very intimate act. Sharp teeth going through the skin? Penetration. The bite symbolizes sexual intercourse. The problem? The woman is either unconscious or in a state where she is incapable of resisting. Dracula takes from a woman what he wants and then kills her. Unless he really likes her, then he enslaves her, forcing her to do his bidding for all eternity. Where I come from, we have a term for this, and the word is not romance. One of the more overlooked symbolisms of Dracula, and ironically is the one that's right in our faces, is Count Dracula's name. He's not Ditch Digger Dracula or Fisherman Dracula or even Accountant Dracula. He's Count Dracula, a member of the European aristocracy. Count Dracula is wearing the clothing of the European aristocracy from several centuries before the time this story takes place. Count Dracula's clothing symbolizes how he as an individual is out of time and out of place. It also emphasizes his unnaturally long lifespan, but it also symbolizes how the aristocracy is out of place within the time period that the story takes place. 
This idea is reinforced with Count Dracula's castle being a ruin. Castles were more than just homes. They were seats of government. Having a seat of government now in a ruin means it's no longer relevant. It is a relic of the past. The aristocracy gained their power and legitimacy through feudalism. By 1900, the time of the novel, most of Europe was no longer operating under feudalism. The remnants of the aristocracy were now seen as parasites on society, just as Count Dracula was a parasite on society. We see this idea reinforced when Count Dracula goes to the theater to stalk, I mean meet, Dr. Stevens and his party. Just a few generations before, it would be the aristocracy sitting in that private box watching the play. But they've been usurped by the professional class as represented by Dr. Stevens and his group. Count Dracula targeting Dr. Stevens' family represents the struggle between the two groups for power and how by the time of the story, the aristocracy had become completely dependent upon the professional class for their continued existence. I want to go back to the story I told you all at the beginning of this video, specifically the part where the three ladies got all freaked out having to walk several blocks through Paris in the dark at 1 a.m. back to where we were staying. Those ladies had walked that path, subway station to where we were staying, in the dark many times, never got freaked out. Henriette, she had a black belt in kickboxing. She was also a certified trainer in kickboxing. When Henriette found out that I had a background in martial arts, she was always trying to spar with me, usually in the most inappropriate situations, like being in line to some famous museum or prestigious building. That woman did not need me to protect her. So why was she and the other ladies freaked out? To answer that question, we first have to answer the question, why did the three of them want to go to the opera with me in the first place? We go back to a topic I keep talking about on this channel, traditional feminine power. In Western culture, going back to at least the Greeks, there is the belief that men protect culture, women nurture and preserve culture. And through nurturing and preserving culture, that's how women civilize men. One of the ways a society shows that women have power within that society is by allowing them to take control and be the center of attention of social and cultural rituals. Another quick way to see how much power women have within society, within these social and cultural rituals, how much do men cover up and women uncover? The logic is pretty straightforward. The more a woman can uncover her feminine beauty in a public setting safely, that means women at large have done a better job at civilizing men, in particular the ones in the current setting. And what is a classic example of a social cultural ritual? Opera. Within hours of joining the group, I realized most of these girls came from very sheltered, protected backgrounds. They had no clue. I spent a large chunk of my time hovering around the edges, slapping the hands of pickpockets, getting a little rougher with creeps trying to cop a feel or worse, making sure young ladies who had a bit too much to drink got home safely, on and on and on. Most of the young ladies had no clue. They didn't know what I was doing. Henriette and a couple of the others were very aware of what was going on. They realized they had the opportunity to engage in a social cultural ritual, the opera, where they could be the center of attention and uncover, and oh, did they uncover. But what's the foreground without a background, a man who's been civilized by women? That's why they came to me and announced, we're taking control of this little event, and oh, by the way, you're going to dress up, cover up, become the background. Every single culture that has been created by humans has its built-in flaws and contradictions. Can you all see a potential rather obvious problem with this whole foreground, background, uncovering in public arrangement? What if a dangerous predator infiltrated the background? He dresses like the background. He walks like the background. He talks like the background. He has all the social graces as a man who's been civilized by women, but he's a dangerous predator nonetheless. What if this dangerous predator has a high social position, 
say like government official, it would make it almost impossible to resist his aggression. We see women in nightgowns and negligees. This implied nudity doesn't represent sensuality, sexuality. It symbolizes their vulnerability. Count Dracula sneaks into a woman's bedroom and attacks her while she's at her most vulnerable, while she sleeps. Count Dracula attacks the most vulnerable members of society at their most vulnerable moments. At the end of the day, Dracula is nothing more than a coward. Anytime he's confronted by somebody who can resist him, he runs away. Dracula represents the violent attack on traditional feminine power. He takes that power and twists it and distorts it for his own desires. The woman has no say in the process. In fact, she doesn't even control her own body. What frightened Henriette and those two ladies that dark Paris night, besides the dark and the fear of the unknown, was the fear of losing control. Coming back from a social cultural ritual in a very uncovered state, the fear was having the thing that gives them their feminine power in the first place being turned against them. As the ladies' minds were running wild and they were experiencing feelings of being completely out of control, they were desperately holding on to the one thing they knew they still controlled, me. So, Bella Lugosi's Dracula, evil, dangerous predator, existential threat to women. What changed? Postmodern and feminist critiques argue that Maya, Dr. Stewart's daughter, represents Western culture's repression of feminine sexuality. Dracula represents the rejection of traditional Judeo-Christian sexual morality. And the bite is the moment Maya becomes sexually free. So let me get this straight. Feminists were saying the only way a woman can be sexually free is if a man liberates her? Ooh, I don't know if that was what they were going for. It was this critique that allowed the rehabilitation of Dracula. He went from dangerous predator who would kill you for his own enjoyment to a naughty bad boy who would give you an eternity of sexy fun time. I'm just scratching the surface of all the symbolism built into Dracula. I mean, we didn't even get into any of the religious stuff. Now, I'm not criticizing all the different reinterpretations of Dracula over the years. Your story, your rules. But one thing I will emphasize, something I keep saying over and over again, if you're going to mess around with symbolism, you better know what you're doing. A lot of these modern reinterpretations of Dracula keep the core evil elements of Dracula, but they then want to wrap it over with this modern sexy time fun stuff. Those two are incompatible. What you end up with is a Dracula that's just as evil, if not more so, than the original. At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.